All over Britain, a new breed of detective is at the forefront of the battle against a rising tide of serious crime. Their work often goes unseen. But for the first time, we go behind closed doors with Lancashire's top police investigators as they attempt to solve the most mysterious and horrifying crimes. A stabbing. Police emergency. Please hurry up, because he stabbed him. He's scared. Armed robbery. You're under arrest on conspiracy to steal in excess of £185,000. Arson. Arson with intent to endanger life. Are you guilty of that offence? Please! This is the inside story of how Lancashire's major investigation team brings some of the UK's most dangerous criminals to justice. And you're going to be charged with two offences. The first one is a Section 18 assault, which is the highest level of assault. The second one is possession of an offensive weapon. Rishton, Lancashire. The town's residents have been shocked by an armed robbery at the local post office. CCTV shows the full horror of the attack, which netted nearly £200,000 in cash. Leading the hunt for the armed robbers is Detective Inspector Simon Upton. Thank you for coming. Uh, Simon up to the SIO for this uh, investigation. This robbery took place uh, around um, half past five on Friday the 5th of May. Richton Post Office, which is on the high street. Fridays will significantly have a, a lot more money uh, at the post office, mainly due to things like pensions, etc. And also, uh, this is like the funnel to the cash machine, which will be obviously loaded up for the weekend, so we'll be putting maximum cash in there. It was a nasty armed robbery that was committed. The victim was uh, in the process of cashing up after the, the actual uh, post office was closed. It would appear that the suspects have drilled some four holes in a lower wooden panel door, gained entry, and then proceeded to attack uh, the post office worker. Behind the counter is Mohammed Iqbal, the brother of the postmistress. He told the police that robbers came through the back door held him at gunpoint and knocked him out with chloroform. They emptied the safes to the tune of £186,000 and then they made good their escape in the victim's vehicle. There are puzzling aspects to this case. To reach the back door, the robbers had to climb over an eight-foot-high wall which had a CCTV camera next to it. But the camera didn't record anything. Beyond the wall is uh, a camera a couple of weeks before. That camera was targeted by an individual or individuals with spray paint, which basically made the camera inoperable. This is a camera which is disabled. You wouldn't see that camera from the public area of the alleyway because it's hidden by this wall. So when that's been disabled, they've had to climb over this wall and spray paint it. You'd need to be aware that camera was there yeah. before disabling it, wouldn't you? The detectives find it odd that the damaged camera wasn't reported to the police and that there are no witnesses who saw the thieves climb the wall either to disable the CCTV camera or rob the post office. These irregularities prompt the detectives to re-examine the CCTV from inside the post office. That's the front door, isn't it, to the post office? Yeah, because he's put the um, shutter down there. See, that reaction is just unusual, isn't it? Yes. Bear in mind, he's on his own in the post office, so that will be, you know, massive. Well, this, this part now, he's right in front of the door. The person who's come through that door, because that door hasn't got a peephole, has come with the sheet up. How do they know he's there? No, that's a good point, yeah. How do they know there's only the one person? Because they're just holding one sheet up to put over him. 
placing the gun there for just 10 seconds in a way of making us aware that there is a gun. But then the gun's not seen again. It's just placed on the side for us to see briefly. And knowing that, the postmaster will be there alone. And that, for me, is what started me thinking, really. His reaction was just very much, let it happen. And, and your natural reaction, I think, will be one of sheer fright, just the fact that somebody's in a building that's supposed to be empty. Theoretically, if they didn't know anything about the post office, they'd be shouting at him, wouldn't they? Yeah. You know, where's the money, where's the safe, you know? Yeah. Is there anything in the ATM machine? Car keys. Yeah. I've been doing this job long enough to know um, when something just doesn't add up. The unusual aspects of this case make the detectives decide to pursue a very different line of inquiry. Ten miles away in Preston, the busy city centre is disturbed by another violent crime. CCTV, I've got a possible stabbing on camera. The mail's run off. I've gone on to Carlisle Street. I'm just hearing details of a possible stabbing over. Face emergency. Please hurry up because he's stabbed him. He needs an ambulance. I'm scared. An 18 year old man has been stabbed and is in a critical condition. The victim is fighting for his life in intensive care. So that's one single stab wound to his stomach, which has nicked his aorta, but he's in an induced coma. Life-threatening, um, could go either way. It is very serious offence, so the investigation could move into a, a homicide murder investigation. Eyewitnesses saw two young men running away from the crime scene. Officers are searching the city for anyone who fits the description of the attackers. I think there's a possibility that these kids are just wandering the streets because of the impact of, of what they've been involved in and what they've possibly either done or seen. I'm just going to have a drive round, keep an eye out. Just take that off for us a minute. Do you, have you heard about what happened at the back of Willie Banjo's? Yeah, You've not got any knives on you, have you? You don't carry knives, you're not stupid that, no, are you? You don't look stupid. Okay. You're going to stick together, aren't you, gents? Yeah. See you later. A witness has told detectives how the incident started. The two lads want to have a fight with the victim. He refuses, obviously, there's, there's two of them, one of him. Our victim has come out of the bank and been pursued by two offenders. They've then asked him into the alleyway at the bottom of the, the town centre street. He has gone in there and during some sort of melee, it appears that he's been stabbed by one of the offenders. PC Jerry Jarosh now has the name and address of a suspect. We're going to utilise the early hours of the morning and just try and sneak up on his home address in the hope that he's slipped home to go to bed and we'll catch him asleep. Rob, we've got an answer at the front. He's not here and the, his mum's been up all night waiting for him. He obviously knows he's wanted. He's running around hiding. She's literally sat in the front room waiting for him to walk through the front door. And has been all night. It's as serious as it gets, to be honest. At the moment, we've got our victim in hospital. We don't know whether he's going to live or die. Back in Rishton, the police are investigating the robbery of nearly £200,000 from a post office. Detectives have doubts about the version of events put to them by the victim, Counter Clerk Mohammed Iqbal. They're also concerned about his behaviour. When we first attended the post office on the Friday evening, Iqbal was there. 
there are certain key things that he, the way he was acting, um, he was reluctant to provide his PIN code for his mobile phone, the way he engaged with his sister, little things like that that started to make a little, uh, find him a little bit suspicious. Extensive analysis of a series of suspicious phone calls has now identified the gang that they think stole the cash. After quite an intensive investigation, the number of detectives from ECID have identified three suspects, those being Terry Yarwood, his brother Jason Yarwood and Aves Samad. As a result of the investigation, we've also identified a fourth suspect, and that is Mohammed Iqbal, the victim. They're now convinced the robbery was an inside job in which Mohammed Iqbal was pivotal. When we looked at the telephony of who Iqbal was ringing around them times, that leads us to his best friend, Terry Howard. Then when we look at who he's ringing around them key times, we see he's ringing his brother, Jason Yarwood, and we look at the contact them two are having with a, the fourth offender, Aves Samad. So when you're putting all that together, you start to see, well, the movements are fitting in with what you're starting to suspect. If the gang of four think they're in the clear, they're in for a shock. The police's next step will be to arrest them. So the element of surprise for us just makes our job a lot easier. I do think they probably do think they've got away with it. Detectives are investigating an armed robbery of nearly £200,000 from a post office in Rishton. Counterclerk Mohammed Iqbal claims he was the victim of the robbery, but detectives now consider him a suspect. We treated him fully as a victim, as we would with anyone at that time, until we start to build up the evidence chain and start looking at him differently. And it's a big thing for when you switch with somebody from becoming victim status to suspect status. And you need to be really nailed on in your belief in that before you'd ever start to treat somebody as a suspect. What we didn't want to do was just go for one, two or three of the suspects and leave one outstanding. Because obviously if we do that, then you start giving the people that we don't get an indication that we're actually after them. So we try the best we can to try and get all four suspects at the same time. Detectives plan to surprise Iqbal and his three associates. Terry Yarwood, Jason Yarwood and Avez Samad by arresting them simultaneously. Yeah, at the moment, we're just waiting for the uh, officer in charge to uh, give the authority for the uh, strike on all four addresses. We're in Rishton. We're parked right up back, um, right behind the post office, right at the end of that street. They're sending over a couple of others because, at the minute, he's not behind the counter. They think, they think he's in the back, so they don't want him to do a runner. Sarge, our plus two has arrived now. 783 to all teams, team one, two, three and four, strike, strike, strike. Team one received. Hiya, can I come through? Mr Rickball, can I come through please? Can you open up the shutter? Please, can you open the shutter? I'm asking politely, can you just open the shutter up, please? The officers are checking around the back of the address. At the moment, it looks like there's nobody in at this uh, time. Right, Mr Rickbell, you're under arrest. Right, to revert the course of justice. Possession of fire, section 18 firearm with intent to commit an indictable offence. Huh? And for conspiracy to steal, OK? You do not have to say anything, but it may on be defensive. Do not mention when questioned something which you later rely in court. Anything that you do say may be given in evidence. Well, what Come on, you? out you go. Yeah, Mr Wickwell, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I've just explained that. what you're under arrest for. Yeah, but, but for what reason? I've just explained. Why am I being too difficult? OK, I'm going to put you in the back of this van. Well, what have I done, though? Like I said, three offences. Attempting to pervert the course of justice. 
conspiracy to steal, and possession of a firearm. All right. Officers have to break into the house of their second suspect, Aves Samad. Police with warrants! He's not in, so they wait for him to come home. Hopefully the uh, gentleman we're after is on his way back from work. Um, it's been identified, he's hopefully coming back to this address. You're under arrest on conspiracy to steal in excess of £185,000. OK, do you understand? I do, but I don't understand the offence. OK. It's when you get down to the Surely there must have been a mistake or something. All right, just watch your head. Where's the group? There. All right, just have a seat. Where are you going to? Uh, Blackburn. Blackburn. Can you call my father? We'll sort that out when we get to custody, all right? Are you working at the moment? Yeah. Uh, post, uh, postman. Post office. Post office OK, do you want to take your shoes off at the door for me, please? Sorry. Shoes off. I was very confused by it. Uh, very surprised as well to see a couple of police officers walking in and coming behind the counter to arrest him. Uh, he wasn't expecting that. Uh, he's been asking non-stop what uh, offences he's been arrested for, even though it was explained to him. Two down, two to go. There are four suspects that we need to try and find. Unfortunately, at the moment, we've only found two. We've got a custody time clock that we need to look at now for two of the suspects in, in the cell, so we've got uh, quite a bit of work to do in respect to some interviews with those people, and we've still got to try and locate the, the two outstanding, so quite a lot to do, to, to be fair. Ten miles away in Preston, an 18-year-old has been stabbed. Detective Sergeant Haley Jones is investigating. At the moment, we don't know whether he's going to live or die. If there's a knife involved in a crime, obviously we need to bring those people in as soon as possible. A taxi driver has helped the police locate one of their two suspects. 17-year-old Kingsley Cairns. We've caught one suspect already. He actually appears to have got in a taxi further away from the scene. He's then made off from the taxi without paying for it. The taxi driver has rung us, told us where he had actually taken that suspect. We've had some uniform officers in a support unit who've actually gone straight to that address and arrested him. With one suspect in the cells and one on the run, Haley revisits the crime scene. There's no CCTV in the alleyway at all. There is town centre CCTV, which covers the main street. We think that the main suspect has made his way down the alleyway towards the bottom and exited at the bottom end. And we think that the second suspect has actually gone back onto the main street and headed in the same direction. An eyewitness has placed Kingsley Cairns at the scene of the crime. She sees two males. She positively identifies one male as uh, Kingsley because he lives nearby to her. Kingsley, wanting a fight with him, is very much, no, I don't want to fight with you. And she says, I don't know how, but they're now in the entrance to the ginnel. She then sees Kingsley lunge forward and then almost instantly two boys goes very still and um, his whole body pauses and then he's saying he stabbed me he stabbed me 
Detective Constable Ian Zanelli and CCTV analyst Katie Quayle study camera footage of the victim and the two suspects before the stabbing. This guy in the middle here looks like he's got something in his hand there. We just follow him. There's our victim. And he goes into the Halifax. So then we have two males there and there. And it's as if they are following him. Right, OK. Plenty but of people see, over there, though, There are, they? yeah. Picking up that sign there, throwing Was it over. Was that one with the light trousers? No, it seems to be the one with the dark trousers. Given the fact that it's happened at 5 o'clock on a Monday evening, yeah. there's always going to be plenty of witnesses. Town centre, so there's always a lot of CCTV. Kingsley Cairns has been caught on camera running away from the crime scene and possibly trying to conceal a weapon. But as he starts to run, that's the best facial image of him there. Yeah, he seems great. to hold his trousers. Yeah. He crosses over past Holiday Inn, doesn't he? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yes, yeah. And there's a still of that? There's a still of that image, yeah, mm. of him, of there. Right. There's a few pieces of significant evidence, certainly around this case. Um, he's been named by quite a few people. He's yeah. going to find that quite difficult to explain away. It's time to talk. First question I'm going to ask you then, Kingsley, is who responsible for the stabbing of the yesterday afternoon and what on the duty side? First, I'll ask you questions, Kingsley, is there anything you would like to say? Mm -hmm. okay. You accept people are going to be advised to go no comment, that's just part and parcel of, of interviewing people. But to not answer it, to not let you finish your questions, and throughout he just stare at you as though he's trying to intimidate you. He, he really didn't give a shit about what he'd done. The second suspect unexpectedly arrives at the police station, brought in by his mother. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, he's handed himself in with more. She's down there now, is she? We've got one um, outstanding suspect we've been looking for overnight and into this morning. Um, he's just handed himself in at the front desk with his mum, with him only being 16 years of age. Um, so we've just sent an officer down just to bring him into custody. An interview with the co-accused, the other lad that we believe was present, that's going to be happening within the next half an hour, I'd say, because he could potentially give up some quite key evidence. Well, there's every chance that he might. He might give an account. I mean, it's, uh, it is, it's an extremely serious allegation. Who's going to come out for you, Mum or Dad? Mum's at the front desk. Oh, she? Yeah. So he's in a big hole, really, and it's up to him to try and dig himself out of it. The next couple of hours are absolutely critical for which way the investigation goes. The interview with the second suspect could provide the police with the crucial evidence they need. It's a typically busy Saturday night in Blackburn when the police are called to help with a house fire. Right, come on, go on, go on another job. Call from Fire Brigade. They've got a fire, they've got three pumps at scene and confirmed that person definitely uh, inside. When the police arrive, the fire brigade have extinguished the fire. It's the way from there, uh, fire is still uh, assessing this property. However, it's believed that all parties have been removed from the, uh, the property. A woman who was inside the house could have been killed, but a delivery man pulled her to safety. Um, females in the back of the ambulance. So we'll see what, um, see what she's had to say. A witness comes forward to say that earlier in the evening he saw the woman being threatened by her partner. The just approached the boss right. and uh, is basically saying he's witnessed the altercation between her and the partner right. just prior to the fire happening. But the woman's partner isn't here now. Any idea where he might be? Nope. 
they're just trying to find out. They're trying to get a, a, a story off her as well. <laughs> the police need to speak to this man. So we're looking to try and get her partner's details. Officers carry small portable computers, which give them access to records of known offenders. So we did just find out who we were actually looking for. It's giving us a name of him. So it's just a matter of doing the intel checks out to try and find him. Quite a distinctive name. So uh, surely somebody will know where he is or who he is. The name of the suspect is Mark Grimbledeston. That's who it is. Yeah, he's well known. 40 year old white male. Um, so they'll do, they'll do the intel checks on him now. The suspect has an extensive criminal record. Theft, public order, drugs, firearms. All over the last sort of 20 years or so. Got another address which we can try. We'll try and find him. Officers have traced Grimble Destin to an address one mile away from the house fire. He's arrested and taken to Blackburn Police Station. The victim's partner, Mark Grimbledeston, appears to have had too much to drink. I can't even know fucking what I've been arrested for. Mark's got detention danger on So he's put in the cells to sober up before he can be questioned. Police hope that in the morning he'll reveal the truth about this serious life-threatening fire. Mohammed Iqbal has been arrested on suspicion of conspiring to rob the post office run by his sister. She was completely unaware of his plan for an inside job. We knew some time ago what we suspected, which was the victim was involved. And from there, then it's just about a, a large jigsaw puzzle, I suppose, just putting all the pieces together and getting to the stage that we're at today. Detectives don't believe Iqbal's account of the heist. Mohammed Iqbal claimed they've come down this rear alleyway, climbed over the rear wall, got then dressed up in the CSI suits, proceeded to commit the offence, then take Mohammed Iqbal's vehicle and drive off. The problem we've got with that scenario is no one's seen them in the rear alleyway. So what we suspect actually happened is that at the lunchtime of the Friday, Mohammed Iqbal, the postmaster, has left the post office for about three hours, and we know he's travelled back to the Preston area. Gone to Preston, picked up the offenders, brought them back into the post office, and because it's an internal garage at the post office, could have driven them in without anybody seeing. He's gone back to work, they've got kitted up, and then they've committed the offence ten minutes after he's shut the door. Lee challenges Iqbal in an interview. Are you responsible for the theft of £186,000? No, no, I'm not. No. And do you know who is responsible? I don't know. What we're saying, Mohammed, is the CCTV has been checked and checked again, and nobody, bearing in mind how big that wall is, nobody's been seen scaling the wall. And like no. Lee's explained, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, They've got in somehow, and we put it to you that you have collected them from Preston and brought them back. I have not collected them, I was on my own. These men have became ready, fully suited up, in the broad daylight, coming down that road, being seen. It doesn't make sense. In interview, Iqbal's come across the way he's come across most of the way through this investigation. Claimed his innocence, insisted he's innocent. He became a little bit wavy in his account when we started to put the evidence to him towards the end of the interview. 
I think he started to acknowledge and appreciate there's a case building up against him here. Well, we think that Abbas has come across to Rishton right. as the getaway driver. So you took them into the post office. I haven't taken them in the post office. I'm telling you again and again, and I'm being serious now. I have not taken anyone in the post office, and I would not risk anything to jeopardize my life or my family's life. Simple as that. Why would you be jeopardizing anyone's life? Why would I even do such kind of stupid, you know, this kind of shameful like? act? Give me one good reason. Why? One hundred eighty-six thousand pounds. What's that got to do with it? One hundred eighty-six thousand pounds. Well, that's quite a motive. To yeah, motive for what? For theft. Iqbal's friend Terry Yarwood is now under arrest. The police have found that his mobile phone records place him in the vicinity of the post office two weeks before the robbery, at the time that the CCTV camera was disabled. We know from the camera's CCTV being disabled that at quarter to one is when the camera was sprayed. And then at 2.25, he then calls Mohammed Iqbal for three minutes, 29 seconds. That's a long telephone call to have with a friend at 2.25 in the morning. Lee now has enough evidence to charge all three men. The first offence is that Rishton Blackburn conspired together with other persons to steal monies to the value of £185,699 and one pence. It's really satisfying that we've got to the stage, one, that we've identified the suspects, and secondly, even more satisfying that my gut feeling that the post office worker was involved has actually been uh, borne out true through the, the evidence chain, I suppose. You conspired to steal from a shop committed on the 20th of May 2015, and the offence is that on or between the 20th of May 2015 and the 6th of June 2015 at Rishton Blackburn conspired together with other persons to steal monies to the value of £185,699 and one pence belonging to the post office. Do you have any reply to that? I'm not accepting all this because I've not done anything. OK. I'm not accepting all this. I haven't done anything. But to be honest with you, if you look at the case, I've not even done anything, to be honest with you. OK, Mohammed, we can't discuss the case now. I know you've been charged with it, OK? OK, I'm going to put down as you reply, I'm not accepting this. Do you want me to put anything else as you reply? I've not done it. That's why I'm saying that I've not done it, so... Would you like a drink or anything? Are you sure? How many each offence carries you? How many years? He won't tell you that because they have a minimum and maximum sentence. That's up to the court. Still need to know. He won't tell you that. He won't tell you... But how many years does he carry? I just want to know. He won't tell you that for various reasons. One, he doesn't make the decision. I know, but two, he doesn't make Mahmoud, I just want to know Mahmoud, the Mahmoud, two, they vary between a lot. And three, we're not going to tell you that to cause you ex extra worry. No, I just want to know, please. Right, well, I'll tell you that. The imitation firearm offence carries a life sentence. Does that... That doesn't help you, does it? And? It doesn't matter if that carries a life, then the other three are irrelevant, aren't they? The other two are irrelevant, because that's a life. They can't be any higher than that. And the other two? I don't know them offhand. But that's a maximum sentence. In Blackburn, Detective Sergeant Mark Saunders is leading the investigation into a suspected arson. Yeah, just through here, the specialist investigators uh, trying to determine uh, exactly what's uh, caused the fire, whether it's been done deliberately. Detectives suspect that the fire may have been started intentionally by the partner of the woman who was rescued from it. It appears that the seat of the fire is there. There's been a, a huge amount of energy that's then scorched the roof. It's taken the plaster off the ceiling. It's scorched all around the, the skirting boards. Detective Constable Amanda Blezard is also working on the case. A woman has been rescued from the address by uh, a takeaway delivery man. If she'd not been rescued, um, they think she probably would have died in the house fire. The lack of definitive evidence about how the fire started 
puts pressure on Detective Constable Amanda Blazard to get answers from her suspect in an interview. Oh, so with intent to endanger life, are you guilty of that offence? I can't remember. I went out to the pub and I cannot remember anything. All I did was walk up at my bed with police at the door. You remember you were, when you were woken up, you realised you were at your mum's house, is that yeah. what you're saying? Right. Yeah, like, what the fuck am I doing here? Who's at the door, right. you know what I mean? What was the arrangement? You said your mum's gone on holiday. Yeah. Um, to Turkey. She said, just come over and keep an eye on things. She says, help yourself to food and just make sure everything's all right. He said he can't remember anything. Is there any way of checking out that account he's given about his mother? Being we could do some work on that, can't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless we get anything, any breakthrough, uh, he'll be bailed for further inquiries. So we'll have to look at the safeguarding around the victim. Worst case scenario here is we will have to go to Crown Prosecution Service and they may decide there's not enough this evening, so we'll have to bail him. We're going to need some evidence and we've no forensics saying he set fire to the house. So unless we get something other than that, I don't think CPS are going to run it. They certainly won't run it tonight, so it is going to be tough. The detectives need to gather evidence on their suspect urgently. If he walks free, the victim could once again be at risk. In Preston, Detectives are investigating the brutal stabbing of an 18-year-old. The victim was stabbed in the stomach and is in hospital undergoing surgery. We've got our victim in hospital. He is in a very serious condition. The team are working around the clock. How is everyone? Tired. Tired. Are you all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? You've both had some sleep. You might have these long days and they're stressful and everyone's kind of working the backsides off but you're getting these little things that are coming through and it's worth the long hours and i don't know you have to do anything i'm not sure there's many other jobs you could do the police have now found cctv of their main suspect kingsley cairns getting into a taxi just after the attack Detective Constable Ian Zanelli challenges him about this. Did he call the taxi yesterday? No comment. Any reason why he might legitimately carry a knife? No comment. Do you want to hazard a guess at how it went? Bless your no comment. Yep. Not one comment. Not one. Nothing. No. no. I put him back in his cell a couple of months after the interview and he's bawling his eyes out. And he was crying because he wanted to go home. He was crying because he was missing his mum. Um, and then he'd walk out into a kind of public arena of the custody with the people there, and his chest would come out, his shoulders would be wide open. The second youth has been arrested, but he's not talking either. Talk, talk me through your um, movements yesterday afternoon from about four o'clock. The police have obtained CCTV of both suspects walking together outside a bank, close to where the stabbing occurred. <laughs> Look how distinctive the trainers are. Oh, yeah. We got them. The cloak, yeah. But that's the jacket. We've got that coat on. Yeah, and facial there. Bloody hell. Good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Can't, you can't get better evidence than that, can you? The Crown Prosecution Service has told Haley she has enough evidence to charge Cairns. I'm going to explain to you what's going to happen, OK? We've had Crown Prosecution Service advice, and you're going to be charged with two offences, OK? The first one is a Section 18 assault, which is the highest level of assault. And the second one is possession of an offensive weapon. So the first one is on the 21st of December 2015 at Preston, unlawfully and maliciously caused grievous bodily harm. Do you want to make any reply to the charges? No, no reply, Sarge. Right, so we're going back to the cell and somebody will pick you up in the morning, OK? Do you need anything else? The second suspect 
will be released this evening on conditional bail. He will be on a curfew between certain hours. There will be some kind of exclusion zone to keep him out of the city centre. We haven't got to the bottom of the motive. There's suggestions of uh, arguments over Facebook and girls being involved. Certainly not enough to, to justify what's happened. Detective Constable Amanda Blazard is investigating Mark Grimbledeston for an arson attack. Try not to fidget and move, just stare at the camera. Grimbledeston claims he was house sitting for his mother when arrested. Amanda has a good reason to doubt his alibi. Can we clarify that where you're arrested is actually your home address and you bought it with inheritance money after your parents have passed away and they aren't on holiday in Turkey? Why have you told us your mum's in Turkey when she's dead? I don't know. Because it just makes me wonder what else you've told me in an interview that you've not been truthful about, Mark. Well, no, it doesn't matter that one. When Grimble Deston was arrested, the police obtained a mobile phone, which could be a vital source of evidence. The phone is massive at this moment in time. The sooner we can get that phone read, the better, and the sooner we can have a look through and see if there's any text messages or any phone calls that might incriminate him. Is it a white iPhone you have? Yeah. Right, OK. Do you know your telephone number for that white iPhone? No. You don't? No. How long have you had that phone? A fair bit. Do you have a pass number on it? Yeah. What's your passcode number? Why? It will take the police a lot longer to access Grimble Destin's phone records without his number, but he refuses to reveal it. Amanda is now in a race against time. If Grimble Destin is an arsonist, it would be dangerous to release him. But Amanda has found a way to get the mobile phone number. That number from that phone raid. He's used it to ring us in November 2012 on an inquiry. Right. So if he tries and tells me in an interview that so that's not his fault, 2012, so he's had that number for three years. Now they have Grimble Destin's phone number, detectives look for evidence in his phone text messages. Two text messages from the night of the fire are particularly incriminating. He sent what a message to her. Literally just after midnight, his text is saying, you help, I'm in your house, it's on fire. Then he's messaged his mate, I think I've set fire to her house. We've got a series of text messages now making mention of a fire, making mention of his intention to kill her. He's guilty, isn't he? At midnight, you send a text saying, house is on fire. Oh, seriously, I can't remember nothing. I told you I was paralytic drunk and I don't remember nothing. When you've sent them text messages, Mark, what were your intentions? Nothing. I, I, I had no intentions at all of doing anything. No, it's, it's, it's up to us who come into the... It's time to charge Grimble Destin. Yeah. Charge will be arson with intent to endanger life. That's the most substantive offence. All right, you're charged alone with arson with intent to endanger life. Offence committed alone on the 10th of January 2016. Have you got any reply to that? Those charges? Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Mark, due to the serious nature of the offence and the likelihood of interfering with witnesses, I can't grant you bail. Uh, I'm sure your solicitor will make a bail application tomorrow morning at court. What's the cell number, sir? Bravo one. I'm just checking which cell you're in. When I go home, if I think I've, I've made a difference and protected someone and hopefully prevented any kind of violence in the future, then, then that's a reminder why I joined the force. Mark Grimble Destin pleaded guilty to arson with intent to endanger life and was jailed for six years and five months. Kingsley Cairns pleaded guilty to wounding with intent to do grievous bodily harm 
and possession of an offensive weapon in a public place. He was jailed for six and a half years in a youth offender's institution. The other youth pleaded guilty to a fray and was given a 12-month youth rehabilitation order and a 12-month supervision order. Mohammed Iqbal was jailed for two years and four months for conspiracy to commit theft. Terry and Jason Yarwood were both jailed for two years and ten months for conspiracy to commit theft. The getaway driver, Avez Samad, was jailed for three years for conspiracy. The police have so far not recovered the gun seen in the CCTV or most of the £186,000 stolen from the post office.